Today, I'm going to continue sharing uh, about unconditional love. Um, whenever I start a, a topic or whenever I begin to meditate on something, uh, and I think it might be a session or two sessions, you know, it just opens up and unfolds. And there's so much more uh, that I've discovered um, in just meditating about unconditional love, remembering some of the encounters I've had and some of the things um, that God has revealed and shown me about unconditional love and the way unconditional love really has challenged so much of what I've previously thought. Now, I believe there's an awakening occurring all over the world, um, actually all over the cosmos, really. Uh, that awakening is people are awakening. They're being enlightened, I think, to the reality of who God is um, as unconditional love. And that's happening to a degree within what we call the institutional church and many people are leaving the institutional church as a result of that and also outside of it probably more so where people are beginning to awaken to the reality of love and who god really is they may not know him as our father yet but they're being awakened to come into that reality and relationship and it's really exciting that more and more people are joining on this on thus on this amazing journey. And this journey really is to discover who God really is and to discover and experience his love and to discover who we really are as his sons and to come into the fullness of our identity and our position and authority as sons of God within the kingdom of God. So many of the experiences I've had of unconditional love have challenged what I've believed. So they've radically challenged and changed my whole belief system, particularly concerning who God is, and therefore the reach of God's love towards all his creation. It's not just limited to people, all of creation. Jesus created everything for him, through him, it was all by him, and it was created for relationship, and therefore God's desire is to restore everything back to that relational position. God's love, as we've been looking at, is unconditional for everyone. That means there are no conditions. And it, I know it's really hard for some people to embrace the fact that there are no conditions to his love because our religious programming has created conditions that we have to fulfill in order for God to love us. Because love is unconditional, and that includes everyone and everything, that means love has no boundaries and no limitations. And ultimately, limitless grace, triumphant mercy are expressions of unconditional love and who God really is. Therefore, God enables us to overcome every obstacle and his mercy triumphs over every barrier that may be put in the way of our relationship with God. Now, I've believed in the God of the Bible for most of my life. I went to Sunday school when I was two and never didn't believe in God. But actually, when I met God face to face, when I met him as father, I realized that I had been deceived by a lot of religious programming. And the God I thought I knew doesn't actually exist. Therefore, I'm actually an atheist to that God. That God does not exist, even though for most of my life, I thought that the, what I was taught about God and who he was, was the truth. I now realize that I had believed a lot of uh, twisting of truth and some of it downright lies concerning who God is. The good news is that the true God who I met as father, son, spirit went beyond my wildest imaginations in terms of being good, kind loving tolerant patient gracious merciful and my experiences and encounters with god with love have deconstructed my mind's programmed belief systems that was a really difficult process because of the depth of that programming so many things that i never even thought about them not being true have been challenged during an encounter with the father where we were walking in this dimly lit place and he told me to look up and i saw like a construction of network if you like around overhead that was framed by pillars and there were nine pillars 
that were holding up this framework above me and eventually i found out that we were walking within my mind and these were the pillars that were holding up and supporting my belief systems now i had six religious pillars because most of my life has been involved in in christianity and three cultural pillars that supported my beliefs and my worldviews. now to be honest when the father revealed what they were you know i had to look them up because some of them i didn't even understand what they meant but those nine pillars and those supports for my belief systems were programmed by my upbringing and because i had a christian upbringing a lot of those things i just absorbed affected by osmosis um, i never thought about all of them some of them i did and some of them i believe by conviction um, your pillars will probably be different from mine but equally as strong and because they're subconscious mostly they're invisible to our conscious mind we don't know what's framing our beliefs we just believe things but actually the father was showing me that these pillars if he was going to reveal the truth to me these pillars had to be dealt with in my mind now there are nine firestones the in ezekiel it talks about that lucifer as the light bearer walked on in the father's garden or in the garden of eden um, and he walked on those stones and he was to reflect out from him the knowledge or the wisdom or the understanding that would be reflected out to the whole of mankind so that mankind could ascend to maturity now obviously lucifer decided having received the revelation that he wasn't going to give it to us um, and therefore those nine stones eventually became counterfeit or perverted and became pillars that framed our lost minds and when man chose to follow the path of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or humanism effectively then those pillars became the revelation of the truth which actually is not real truth but the truth that we thought and have been programmed by and so i discovered that these nine pillars were very strongly grounded or in my mind or in my consciousness each pillar supports like a veil of lies that filter the light of god and distorts the image of god and his image in us each pillar and veil controls how our minds interpret the data we receive therefore we filter everything through those uh, veils and therefore sometimes we see things and we come to the wrong conclusions about what they're all about and it's really hard confirmation bias is really difficult to overcome because you already believe something and when you look at something it you twist things to make sure it affirms what you already believe and it's very hard for our mindsets to be changed and transformed and only the power of god can really do it so these pillars veils are mindsets established from beliefs that someone has taught us some of mine were religious thinking drawn from old covenant theological ideas that were really meant for a previous day those things became a resting place for words that framed my belief systems and it made sense that it was a consistent system but i discovered it was a wrong system um, and the father continued to reveal that truth because the encounters i had with him challenged the things i thought were true now i believe we're in a new day of revelation of the truth so we can discover the reality of who god is and who we are and our role to play within the whole of creation because these things are being awakened in us so the pillars that supported the construct of my consciousness were evangelicalism i was brought up in a strongly evangelical church setting several church settings in fact sola scriptura the the doctrine that everything has to be in the bible and it's a bible alone protestantism i've never had any catholic connection so didn't have any programming there augustinianism which i had to look up to find out what that really meant a hebrew mindset and a greek mindset now i've never learned hebrew or learned greek but 
the mindsets were still there within the systems, both the religious and the cultural systems that I was brought up with. Um, and then the three which were, were not religious, they were cultural relativism, which I had to look up the meaning of, uh, but a re reality of that is that we're all programmed by the culture we're brought up in and it all becomes relative to that culture of what truth and what is true and what isn't true and therefore two cultures can believe totally opposite things about the same thing um, scientific rationalism i was a scientist worked in biochemistry labs for 18 years um, and humanism because essentially i followed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil like everybody else and therefore humanism programs some of my thinking. Now, sometimes these things clash. Now, when they clashed, generally speaking, the religious programming overcame any cultural programming in my mind, because that was the stronger beliefs. But they all contributed to how I thought. So when the father revealed these pillars and he showed me how my mind was veiled from the light of truth, living in the darkness of deception but thinking darkness was light he then asked me if i wanted him to remove those pillars and if i wanted him to deconstruct my beliefs and he was very uh, kind in the sense because he asked he didn't force this on me he asked if i would cooperate with that and of course i said yes but i hesitated because i thought well if all these pillars come down i'll lose my mind i won't be able to to know anything um, so kindly, the father removed each of those pillars in turn, uh, but it was a, a, a very difficult process. And the first area of deconstruction for me, which really this sort of challenged my understanding of who God was, was really evangelicalism and specifically on my understanding of what happened on the cross, what is known as the atonement. And if you actually break that down the word atonement it says at one moment which actually is so much better understanding of what the whole thing of the cross was about was to bring us into a oneness a union with the father and the son and the spirit so it's to bring us into that oneness but we have all sorts of ideas about what the atonement is what jesus did on the cross now, I'd been taught the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement, PSA, for all my life. I, that's the way I was taught. There was never any challenge. I didn't know there existed any other ideas about what happened on the cross. Now, I discovered when I encountered God just how wrong I was around that subject. And that doctrine really says that God punished or killed Jesus for our sin instead of punishing us so jesus substituted us and god basically killed him and punished him instead of punishing us which on the surface you think wow god loves us so much but then you think of it a bit deeper oh god was willing to kill his son who he also loved that doesn't actually add up when you look at god as love love doesn't kill love doesn't punish so we've got some misunderstanding there um, and when that doctrine was destroyed in my thinking, because I met unconditional love, the unconditionally loving father so many times, many of the other false doctrines which were linked to that one fell like dominoes in a domino rally. And they just fell all over the place. And for a while, it was like, what do I believe? Did anything that I actually believe, was any of it true? Um, now, of course, some of it was, but a lot of it was either twisted or changed in some way to just deceive me into thinking it was true. Now, I discovered that God didn't punish Jesus or anyone else for that matter, um, both by conversations with him and seeing what happened to people after they die and what, what Jesus did with them and really encountering the love of God in such a way that that unconditional nature of it really challenged everything so man required a sacrifice for sin not god and it was man who actually crucified jesus not his father who was actually with him all the way through the cross and i love the scene in the the shack movie or in the book as well of course where uh, papa 
looks and shows his wrists or her wrists in the in the film um, to see the the imprints of the nails. Um, but this was not something that Jesus went through alone. So Jesus actually told his disciples clearly who was going to kill him, and it was not his father. Rather, it was the combination of the religious and political spirit at work through the Pharisees and Sadducees and the high priests and through the Romans as well, um, that they wanted his death. God actually, of course, even brought good out of the rejection and the murder. And Jesus basically said to, to those religious leaders that they were of their father, the devil, who was a liar and also a murderer from the beginning. Um, and that, of course, was a huge challenge to them. And that's part of the reason they wanted to kill him, because he saw through their uh, deception. Now, the father was never separated from Jesus, as I was taught. Um, and that was such a, a erroneous teaching, because that comes on the understanding that God can't look at sin. Um, so God had to turn away from Jesus when he became us, identifying with our sin, our broken, lost identity. In reality, Jesus took our lost identity and fully identified with us in every way to overcome all the obstacles to our reconciliation to the Father. The Father never turned away from Jesus. But that's what I was taught because that backed up penal substitutionary atonement and that whole false doctrinal system. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 says this. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So it's our responsibility to share the good news that we're all reconciled with God. Then it goes on in verse 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, I would say the majority of my life, I had the word of separation, because actually that was what I was taught. We're all separated from God. And yet, this says that we've all been reconciled to God. Now, the reality is, of course, most people don't realize that that is the truth, Therefore, they live in the alienation of their own mindsets and beliefs. And if you believe you're separated from God, then you live in a separated state. Which is hugely sad compared to what Jesus has actually done. So what did happen on the cross? Well, I believe that what happened was Jesus identified with our lostness and he cried our cry of lost identity why have you forsaken me? Now, of course, God never forsook mankind. God never turned away from man. Man turned away from God and walked in independence. But God never turned away. But I was told he did because he couldn't look at sin. Now, when Jesus quoted Psalm 22 on the cross, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In their culture, when a psalm was quoted, the whole of the psalm was known and meant. So Jesus cried that cry because it was our cry, because we thought that we were forsaken because we'd walked away from God. But later on in the psalm, in verse 24, Psalm 22, 24 says this, For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him for help, he heard. So God never actually turned away. That's just a religious doctrine, which is associated with penal substitution atonement and other wrong doctrines around what happened to Jesus on the cross. So God was always there. God was always with him. The father was always listening. The father helped him. And that whole dimension um, took on a whole different meaning when I engaged Jesus on the cross. I actually was taken back to look at Jesus hanging on the cross, and I stood with those in front of the cross, and I looked into his eyes, and they were the deepest pools of love that I could ever have seen. 
it, it was such a moving experience. You know, I, it, I, I wept. I, I encountered and felt what he was going through in, me- in a measure because I was watching what was happening. And it, that was, I think, this was probably back in 2010. That was the, the start of the journey towards realizing that much of what I thought was true about that was, was not. So there are seven major theories of atonement, and some of them have some elements of truth in them. Um, First is moral influence, and that was Jesus came and died in order to bring about a positive change to humanity. Well, I think that's true. God does want to transfigure us and change us and transform us into our true image and bring back our uh, identity. That was one the early church really held uh, quite strongly. The ransom theory, Adam and Eve were sold, sold humanity over to the devil at the time of the fall. Justice required that God pay the devil a ransom. Once the devil accepted Christ's death, not realizing that he was going to be resurrected um, as a ransom, this theory concluded justice was satisfied and God was able to free us from Satan's grip. Now, I'm not sure I believe that uh, in, in fullness, but there's, there is a sense that there's redemption. So redemption buys you back from something. Uh, I believe it's more from lost identity. Then there's Christus Victus. Jesus Christ dies in order to defeat the powers of evil, such as sin, death, and the devil, in order to free mankind from their bondage. And I think there's got a lot to merit that. The early church held a mixture of those first three views, uh, some of them, all of them, and some of them, some of them. Uh, but then in more modern times, other ways of thinking began to take over the satisfaction theory that was brought by absalom of kent i think in the 11th century um, and that was based on augustinian way of understanding forgiveness Um, and that said jesus death is understood to satisfy the justice of god satisfaction here means restitution the mending of what was broken and the paying back of a debt So Jesus satisfies God. Now, I don't believe that. And this then led on to the reformers who then came up with penal substitution atonement. Jesus dies to satisfy God's wrath against human sin. Jesus is punished, penal, in the place of sinners substitution in order to satisfy the justice of God and the legal demand of God to punish sin. Now, I don't actually believe the Bible says that the wages of sin is punishment it does say the wages or result of sin or the consequence of sin is death then there's the governmental theory and this came i think through methodism and jesus suffers the punishment of our sin propitiates god's wrath Um, this theory also teaches that jesus died only for the church and if you by faith are part of the church you can take part in god's salvation which i obviously don't believe Um, So there are these different views. And the last one is the scapegoat theory. Jesus dies as the scapegoat of humanity. Jesus is killed by a violent crowd. The violent crowd kills him, believing that he's guilty. Jesus is proven innocent as the true son of God. The crowd is therefore deemed guilty of what they did. Now, again, you know, this goes back to an understanding of the scapegoat under the law and the different offerings and sacrifices. Now, I don't really uh, believe that, but In my encounters and conversations with the Father, it led me to believe that the cross is an expression of God's unconditional love. It was victory over death. It redeemed us from lost identity. Jesus identified as us. We died and were crucified and were resurrected with him. The cross was Jesus' victory over our enemies, which were sin, lost identity, and its consequence, death which was the result of walking away from the source of abundant eternal life. If you walk away from eternal life and you walk away from the source of life, then you have to get that source from yourself. And that's what man did. So we may have chosen independence, but from the father's perspective, we were always his children. Mankind was never, ever not children of God from God's perspective. Therefore, throughout history, the father continually reached out to man, but each time man turned down the offer of relationship and turned it into some sort of religious obligation or duty. Whereas God has always wanted relationship, man 
because of guilt and condemnation uh, and that doesn't come from god that is self-induced always turns god's offer of free relationship into some sort of religious thing that they can do which actually therefore means they work to earn a relationship with god which means it's not conditional which means it is conditional and therefore that's not it uh, relationships always unconditional from god's perspective so essentially man driven by lost identity created a god in his own image out of guilt and shame that god needed to be appeased by some sort of religious sacrificial system and that's really what i was taught and what i bought into and actually i lived under the bondage of that system which meant i continually had to try and please god and be good enough for him by my performance and of course i failed continually and therefore never matched up to the mark that i had set for myself god didn't set that mark religious systems set some of the marks and i had to try and attain to them thinking that what i was doing was what god wanted me to do but in reality god didn't sacrifice his son jesus willingly identified with man to restore everything that had been lost and god had set this up from the beginning that this was going to take place because love was there in the beginning so jesus overcame sin our lost identity by restoring relationship with the father he overcame death by conquering it and defeating it in the grave where people went after death through the power of resurrection life and we now it says walk in the newness of resurrection life we can walk in that power Therefore, death is not the end of choice to accept Jesus, as again, I'd been wrongly told. Um, and so many gospel messages, well, if you go out and you run over by a bus and you die, well, you're going to go to hell if you don't know Jesus. That, that's the sort of message that I heard over and over again. And that fear inducing message actually, you know, was one which is so common when I was growing up. That was the type of message. It was not based, focused on the love of God. It's more about avoiding punishment, avoiding hell. So my deconstruction continued and it challenged most of my thinking regarding the nature of death, the nature of hell, judgment, resurrection, salvation, being born again, faith, the role of the Bible. And all of these things began to be challenged as I continued to go deeper and deeper into my relationship with God, as I began to look into the Father's face, look deep into his eyes, experience and know his love for me. And when it comes to the Bible, remember Jesus is the living word of God, not the Bible. The Bible is a book composed of many books and letters written by others, which have been put into one book and called a canon of scripture by men. Um, jesus is the living word of god jesus is the way the truth and the life jesus is the resurrection and the life jesus is the door jesus is our access into a relationship with the father and the only way people can access the father but jesus opens that door for people to access not just through the ways that i was told that they could access jesus is always looking to awaken people to the truth that he's operating within them to reveal himself for them so i want to explode some of the religious myths that kept me in a bondage that actually unconditional love has set me free free from um, and i want to talk about the truth about how god views sin and in future sessions uh, the truth about forgiveness about repentance about confession truth about faith the truth about being born again but actually means being born from above truth about salvation the truth about the old and new covenants and where we are in that and the truth about immortality because ultimately unconditional love um, if we are to fully embrace everything that god has for us it brings us to the constant of immortality that through you know i think it's 2 timothy 1 10 that jesus has brought to light through the gospel the light of truth about immortality so god is love but and we finished there last week the last month religion always has buts that create doubt unbelief and trust issues that will require some form of religious programming or key PR, kpis 
key performance indicators to ensure that we adhere to the system's rules. That's what religion does. It keeps you bound to a system of rules to keep you safe. Um, but actually so much, so many people really doubt and fear that they're good enough or what they've done is good enough. And the reality is nothing we can do is good enough. That's why Jesus did everything for us on our behalf. So there are no buts. God's love is totally unconditional. So it is so unconditional that we could never be separated from him. He predestined us to face-to-face -face innocence in love. So he actually designed that we couldn't die. So immortality is an expression of unconditional love because God ensured that we would never die. Now, obviously, we know that our spirit and soul is immortal. But actually, as we will see in future sessions, our body was also created to be immortal also. So one of the most common buts is the cliche that God cannot look upon sin. Now, this lie actually creates guilt and condemnation and makes people feel that they are shamed and unworthy sinners. So actually, that causes people to run away from God rather than to him. And I can remember, you know, particularly in my teenage years, feeling so unworthy because I kept messing everything up all the time, making decisions, doing things and saying things which I knew were not really what God wanted me, but I felt guilty all the time. And that was the normal state for me. And I read a book called The Normal Christian Life, which actually presented a completely different picture that actually the normal Christian life was was not living in guilt or condemnation or bondage, but actually being free. Um, so when I discovered that, that was the first I, part of my journey, I suppose, to not running from God, but running to him. But it took a long time for me to get to the point where I felt I could turn to God rather than turn away from him, or that I felt that he hadn't he turned away from me because of what I'd done or what, anything that I was doing. So the statement that God cannot look upon sin and therefore sinners is really totally ridiculous when you think about it, but it was programmed. So I never thought about it. I just accepted it. God is omniscient and he's omnipresent. So he knows everything and he's everywhere. So he knows about sin, our lost identity, and any behavior that comes from it. And he's present whenever that behavior is, is committed. And whenever we do anything contradictory to our identity, he sees it. He didn't wink at, at it. He didn't turn a blind eye to it. He sees it all. But it's his response to it that's the key. God sees our sin, our lost identity, and his response is not to turn away in disgust, but to demonstrate his nature and his loving kindness to us, which is all contained within his unconditional love, his limitless grace and his triumphant mercy. So whatever we do, his grace is sufficient to overcome. Whatever we do, his mercy is triumphant over. So there's nothing that can ever separate us from the love of God other than our own thinking. And that won't be that way forever because God is renewing our minds. So the Father's love, his grace, his mercy are more powerful than sin overcoming all the obstacles and barriers to our restoration god is at work god isn't passive god doesn't turn away god looks to bring good out of everything that we do even the most ridiculously stupid things that we might do even the most heinous things that we might do he still loves us enough to be at work to bring good out of all those things and that's a powerful um, experience of love when you realize that so if god could not see man, see man's lost condition how could he rescue us from it you know it's just nonsense that god can't see us the way we actually think we are the way people in the old testament describe god was from their own lost identity and religious experience most of that is not really the truth that's why there's such a difference between when jesus came as the express image of god to fully identify who god was to the people and just challenge what they thought about God uh, and to 
basically say, look, you've seen me, you've seen the father, I'm and the father are one, to which, of course, he was called a heretic, and they wanted to stone him and kill him. Um, but that didn't stop Jesus coming, and it didn't stop the father sending him because love was his motive. So what evidence is there that God seeks us out in our lostness rather than turning away from us? Well, Jesus is the proof of that. Jesus is the proof of unconditional love. Now, John 3.16 is probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible and gets plastered all over different things. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, in reading that, there's the thing there is shall not perish. Now, when you hear, hear the word perish, what picture does it bring to your mind? Well, to me, and the picture it brought to my mind was basically being consigned to punishment of hell forever because it was about perishing, which meant being sent to hell. That was the concept. I read that. And although it was amazing that God so loved the world, if you didn't believe you're going to be consigned to hell forever that would meant that verse brought about fear rather than love so in reality the word that was translated perish is in most other places translated lost which totally changes the concept of what that is actually saying so bible translation is framed from pre-programmed theology and is not always faithful to the original meaning of the greek or hebrew so the religious version of that passage says, if you don't believe, you will perish or be utterly destroyed or sent to hell. The true meaning is, if you don't know God's love, you will live in lost identity. And that's totally different. So just one mistranslated word can totally change the meaning and understanding of what God is actually wanting to do in unconditional love. I love John 3 16 from the mirror bible and it says the entire cosmos is the object of God's affection and he is not about to abandon his creation the gift of his son is for humanity to realize their origin in him who mirrors their authentic birth begotten not of flesh but of the father in this persuasion the life of the ages echoes within the individual and announces that the days of regret regret and sense of lostness are over now that carries with it a whole different connotation from what I understood it to mean. And if you look at the notes, it says the King James Version reads, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The same word translated in the King James to perish is translated in Luke 15 to be lost. In order to underline the value of the individual, Jesus tells the famous three parables in Luke 15 of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. Now, all, found, all were found safe and sound. In every one, he repeats the word lost, apollomy, to lose, to emphasize the fact that you cannot be lost unless you belong to begin with. So we belong to God. We are his children. And it's us who have lost sight of that, not him. And in fact, Luke 1 10 says, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came. He took the initiative and came. That demonstrates the fact that he wants a relationship and he came to restore that relationship. And Matthew 18, 12, it says, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that's straying? And of course, it says that we like sheep have gone astray, all turning to our own way. And God didn't leave us in that state. He came to find us and to bring us back from that lostness. That's how much he loves us. So what's the practical evidence that God never turns away from us because of sin? Well, look at Adam and Eve. In the very initial act of following the path of independence, where was God? Not hiding from them, not going back to heaven and saying, well, that's it, tough luck, but searching them out. And he found them hiding with no spirit glory covering to their bodies anymore. So the father didn't see them as sinners who he couldn't look at because they'd now become his enemies because they'd made a decision to disobey him. 
he still saw them as his children and he still wanted to have a relationship with them and he offered them a path to follow through the fire to the tree of life but they chose the path of independence and of self and in that story no the father didn't kill an animal and give them new clothes that's another religious myth they lost their covering of glorious identity and their father clothed them in skin to physically preserve them the father saved them so they could live not die so the father doesn't look at mankind as sinners but as his children who've forgotten who they really are and if we can help people to see that they've just forgotten who they really are rather than trying to make them feel guilty and trying to frighten them into the kingdom of god then we'll help them realize that god loves them and has already reconciled them and they only have to come to a realization of that jesus identified with us from before the foundation of the world to ensure our identity as sons would be revealed and restored this was never at question from god's perspective jesus came identifying with us to make us righteous in our thinking jesus didn't come to change god's mind about us but to change our mind about god and that is so important to see god never changed god has always loved us but we have to see the reality of that and then agree with that reality if we're going to come into the truth of it jesus came to reveal the unconditional love of god as he was god's exact image and he talked so much about love and he actually said a new commandment i've given to you love one another as i've loved you so it's a very simple thing now all we have to do is let him love us and that will inspire us and motivate us and empower us to love others so from god's perspective man was always righteous but because mankind followed adam as their father they went into lost identity became alienated in their own minds and condemned themselves because of guilt and shame that they felt they developed then a humanistic solution to the problem which was always doomed to failure and every religion is based in man's humanistic solution and all non-religious systems are based in man's humanistic system as well because we've tried to come up with well we're god or well we don't need god because we're we've grown up now well i don't really think that's true and to look at the state of the world it's obviously not so mankind was actually made in the image of god in the image of our heavenly father but man created god in their own image and therefore mankind became humanity and humanity is lost and my humanity is the one who couldn't look at god because of their shame the father in his love searched out man right throughout history to restore relationship father always took the first step made the first move towards adam and eve towards noah abraham moses joshua david the prophets no matter who you look at god came he met them he wanted relationship but in each of those occasions they came up with their own system around that which is usually some sort of religious system and workspace system he wanted marriage they chose religious mediation priesthood all sorts of other sacrificial system all around that because they didn't feel worthy enough to enter into a relationship with god who they were afraid of jesus came to fully reveal the father to us as his image and the father in jesus forgave us unconditionally reconciled us to himself justified us as if we would never sinned never gone astray never lost our identity keeping no record of any perceived wrongs and he made us the righteousness of god in christ now that's pretty amazing that is the power of unconditional love he did it all the work on the cross was finished jesus did everything necessary for us to have a restored relationship with god all we have to do is come to a realization of that reality i love this this bible verse or three verses in a from ephesians one it says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And there's just so much truth to that. But reading that, has nowhere near the power of experiencing that so when we get to that place where we are back face to face with him in blameless innocence then the reality of what he's done becomes real to us and it begins to change us and transform us and renew our minds and reveal our sonship so in the mirror bible it says this let's celebrate god he lavished every blessing heaven has upon us in christ he associated us in christ before the fall of the world jesus is god's mind made up about us he always knew in his love that he would present us again face to face before him in blameless innocence and that is the place i dwell in continually face to face in blameless innocence before him which enables me to live in un unconditional love i don't have to do anything other than just be and let him love me because it's all about his unconditional love to me now it's great that i've learned to have unconditional love towards him and trust him and always know that he's got the best for me and good intentions for me and all of that but it's his faithfulness, his dependability that I see when I look into his eyes, when I look into his face, when I feel his heartbeat, when I'm so close to him that I feel the rhythm, which is so comforting of the beating of his heart and the revelation of his heart as he reveals himself to me in a, in a deeper way, which is always going deeper you know you know i wrote things sort of five six years ago about encountering god in love that i couldn't have even imagined could have been topped and yet over the last five or six years uh, time after time after time he's taken me deeper and deeper and deeper into that experience of unconditional love a revelation of himself in verse five, it says, he is the architect of our design. His heart dream realized our coming of age in Christ. His grace plan is to be celebrated. He greatly endeared us and highly favored us in Christ. His love for his son is his love for us. So as much as the father loves Jesus, it's the same love in which he loves you. Because we're included in the circle of love between father son and spirit and we're in the center of that love that they have for one another and is expressed towards us which is so beautiful to experience so the gospel is not about telling people how lost they are but reminding them of how loved they are and that is good news and that should be how we present good news to people so we were never god's enemies but sin death separation were and they still are our enemies and of course jesus conquered them and he didn't wait for us to do anything he chose to come and conquer them and overcome them and included us in everything that he did so romans 5 5 says and hope does not disappoint because the love of god has been poured out within our hearts through the holy spirit who was given to us God wants us to know the reality of his love and experience it. It carries on in Romans 5. It says this, verse 6, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So he didn't wait for us to be good enough to die for. He came in the state we were in, which was completely lost. 
but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners or while we were still in our lost identity, Christ died for us. And while we were still living out that lost identity, Christ died for us. There was never any question of us having to do anything to earn that or deserve it. He did it. And he came when we were alienated from him. God so loved mankind that while mankind was still in bondage to lost identity, he came and demonstrated his love to free us from that lost identity and bring us up back into a restored relationship. That's unconditional love. Jesus died so people who saw themselves separated from him and therefore his enemies could be saved and not punished. God has no personal enemies. No one or no being is an enemy of God who's unconditional love. Unconditional love doesn't have enemies. It just has those that unconditionally love can be demonstrated towards. So Jesus died. So actually mankind's enemies, which were sin and lost identity and its consequence of death were overcome and conquered as he was victorious and his enemies are now under his feet figuratively, meaning Jesus took back the keys of death and, and Hades. He overcame death. He overcame the grave. He conquered it. He was resurrected and resurrected the whole of mankind. I love this verse from Song of Solomon, uh, Song of Songs, uh, verse chapter eight, verse six, and used to sing this as a refrain to a, a Jesus culture song. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as severe as Sheol or the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. Now that that sort of so expresses what I've experienced. God is jealous for me. His jealousy is greater than death, which means he's not allowing death to separate us. And his love is stronger than death. Passionately stronger. Flashes of fire, passion that he has for our relationship. So then in Romans 835 it says well who will separate us from the love of christ will tribulation distress persecution famine nakedness peril sword and of course it's a rhetorical question because the answer is well nothing will but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us so we overwhelmingly conquer well how do we overcome all of those things because we're not separated from the love of god and he loves us it's through his the power of his love that we overcome I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing and no created thing can separate us from the love of God, including ourselves in reality. Um, so again, reading this in the Mirror Bible, what will it take to distance us from the love of Christ? You name any potential calamity, intense pressure of the worst possible kind, cluster phobia, persecution, destitution, loneliness, extreme exposure, life-threatening danger or war. On the contrary, in the thick of these things, our triumph remains beyond dispute. His love has placed us above the reach of any onslaught. This is my conviction. No threat, whether it be in death or life, be it angelic beings, demon powers or political principalities, nothing known to us at this time, nor even in the unknown future, no dimension of any calculation in time or space, nor any device yet to be invented, has what it takes to separate us from the love of God demonstrated in Christ Jesus Jesus is our ultimate authority. So the Father wants us to live in love consciousness, not sin or lost identity consciousness. That is why he kept talking to me about living loved. To live loved is to live in awareness of unconditional love. That enables us to love living. Life takes on a whole different perspective if we're free from the bondage of trying to keep up with the law 
or earn God's favor through duty or obligation. That just wears everyone out. But when we live loving, we're filled with joyous expectation. Every day is an opportunity. And we can live loving in that the love we've received, we can freely give. So religion makes love and acceptance conditional, but God's love is totally unconditional. Therefore, we must be free from these religious mindsets and obligations. So 1 Corinthians 13, 5, which is the famous chapter about love, says love does not keep score of the sins of others. It keeps no record of wrongs. So God keeps no record of wrongs and keeps no score of the things we might do or not do. Therefore, Jesus came to take away the sins of the world, not punish them. Love forgave unconditionally on the basis of what Jesus did in eternity and in time on the cross. Wherever you see the words love or God, they should be completely interchangeable. We should be able to substitute the word love for God in every instance. And if we can't, in whatever we're reading, whether it be the Bible or anything else, then we should question the validity of what we're reading because God is love. And therefore, God is pure love and pure love is God. And if we're reading something that doesn't make sense of God being love, then question it because God is love. And therefore, it's our understanding or what we've been taught about those things which are, in effect, wrong. God is never anything other than love. And of course, it goes on to talk about what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It's not provoked, does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So if God, as love, keeps no record of wrongs, why is religion so sin focused? Every church that I was brought up in was always focused on sin and behavior and how you had to maintain a standard of behavior to be acceptable if you keep focusing on sin and lost behavior it just reaffirms our lost identity that keeps people who think they're sinners coming back for more religious help to feel better and of course that never works because religion is just an addiction that always needs more to fulfill it and you'll never ever feel righteous and know you're righteous if you're addicted to religion colossians 1 13 says when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh again in our lost identity he made you alive together with him it wasn't the fact that we had to do anything he made us alive together with him having forgiven us all our wrongdoings Having cancelled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I mean, that's a powerful statement for being love conscious and not sin conscious. Because it's all dealt with. It's all been already forgiven. And as we read early, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. God's love cancels all debts, holds no record of wrongs, and therefore his forgiveness is as unconditional as his love. And that is so important that you realize that you have been forgiven for everything. Now, that doesn't mean you just go out with the attitude, oh, great, I can just carry on doing terrible things to people and it doesn't really matter because that's not what love is love is wanting the best for other people love will never want anything bad to happen to anybody so what we've received in love having been loved we then can love in the same way that we've received love and therefore if love is conditional what we demonstrate to other people will be conditional and therefore forgiveness is conditional for most people on someone saying sorry or someone quote repenting and we'll look into the meaning of that in another session but it's so important that we realize that we have been forgiven every debt has been cancelled and nothing is held against us therefore therefore there is no any need for guilt or shame so 
all that we might have done in our lives and all of us have history none of that counts before god and he remembers none of it so i would encourage you not to remember any of it either ask him to completely remove any memory of the past so that you're not trapped in what you've done but you realize that you're fully forgiven and therefore there's no more need for forgiveness because it's all dealt with on the cross that's the limitless grace of god and his triumphant mercy but of course religion creates guilt and shame and uses guilt and shame but the focus of god is always on reconciliation and restoration of relationship not trying to operate in self-improvement if there's no record of wrongs then there's no further need for forgiveness sin lost identity is placed as far as the east is from the west it says not as far as the south from the north because if you were south and you walked north you'd end up north if you're east and you walk west you still end up facing east so you can never find anything because god has completely removed it but our religious upbringings often continually focus us on the feelings of guilt and shame which is so important that we get sorted and god uh, wants us to know the reality of forgiveness god has forgiven unconditionally because god is love and love is unconditional therefore love wins because love has always won that's true justice that outworks the judgment of the cross which was a verdict of not guilty innocent just receive that right now you are innocent and as innocent you are able to have face-to-face -face encounters with god you're innocent you are not guilty of anything and if you feel guilty of anything that is not coming from god if you feel condemned about anything that is not coming from god that is coming either from your own inner conscience which has not been touched by the love of god or from religious programming which it, which functions on guilt when jesus came in, in 1 john 29 it says the next day he saw jesus coming to him and he said behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and in revelation 13 8 it says the lamb slain from the foundation of the world therefore love has always won and always will win so jesus figuratively as a lion who roared creation into being and that's what it felt like when i was taken back and to observe and to remember the observation actually of what happened at, at creation people scientists call it the big bang but it was a roar like a lion's roar and literally like a lion has identified with us as sheep therefore has become a lamb because we've all like sheep have gone astray so he's identified with us jesus fully identified with our lostness and our need for a sacrifice so when we know we're loved and when we know that we're forgiven unconditionally we can be free from all religious manipulation guilt shame condemnation we can also be free from the religious slavery to obedience and duty and obligation which most religions put on people to keep them lined up with the rules of that religious system we need to be free we as sons of god are not slaves we're not servants we're not stewards we're co-heirs and co-creators we're seated in places of honor in the heavenly realms and included in the decision making of heaven that is when we mature and come into that place where we know the reality of who we are and all we're called to do now i just want to finish with some things that god said to me in conversation and the father said son my overwhelming love will conquer all things as it will not fail and will never give up my overwhelming love is stronger than death is more jealous than the grave 
nothing can quench its fierce passion and burning desire for restored relationship of face-to-face -face innocence. My love for each of my children cannot fail, can never ever stop any more than I can cease to be I am. Love is the atmosphere of glory, the frequency of heaven, the timeless now within the circle of the dance. There can be no end to love. It is eternal and infinite. It is expanding throughout creation with my kingdom, government, and peace. My love is no beginning, no end. It is the Alpha Omega, the Aleph and the Tap, the living word and truth. Love is the fullest expression and intrinsic essence of I am that I am. So learn to just be loved, living in the rest of love, joy, and peace. In the Mirror Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, 2 says, love is who you are. You are not defined by your gift or deeds. Love gives context to faith. Moving mountains is not the point. Love is. Love is not about defending a point of view. Even if I'm prepared to give away everything I have and die a martyr's death, love does not have to prove itself by acts of supreme devotion or self-sacrifice. Love is large in being passionate about life and relentlessly patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others with kindness. Love is completely content and strives for nothing. Love has no desire to make others feel inferior, has no need to sing its own praises. Love is predictable and does not behave out of character. Love is not ambitious. Love is not spiteful, gets no mileage out of another's mistakes. Love sees no joy in injustice. Love's delight is in everything that truth celebrates. Love is a fortress where everyone feels protected rather than exposed. Love's persuasion is persistent. Love believes. Love never loses hope and always remains constant in contradiction. Of course, the Greek word for love, because there are many different words for love, but that word for the love of God is agape, which comes from the word agu, meaning to lead like a sheep guides his shepherd, a shepherd guides his sheep, and peo, meaning to rest, i.e. he leads me beside still waters. Psalm 23, by the waters of reflection, my soul remembers who I am. And that is what God's unconditional love wants for us. If we come to a place where we stop striving and are still and stop working to earn something from God, by the waters of reflection, my soul remembers who I am. God wants you to remember who you are. God's rest is established upon his image and likeness redeemed in us. God wants us to know our identity as his children. God wants us to know the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, now persuasion and every pleasurable expectation is completed in agape. Faith, hope, love are in seamless union. Agape is the superlative of everything faith and hope always knew to be true about me. Love defines my eternal moment. And God lives with us in that eternal moment, every moment. God is present, God is active, and God wants us to know and experience that unconditional love that he is in every point, in every moment of time, so that we can experience the imminent aspect of that love and the transcendent aspect of a God who is outside of time and space and knows everything and accepts me in unconditional love. So our minds need to be deconstructed from false religious concepts and doctrines. Anything that puts a condition on being loved, we need deconstruction, we need renewal of our minds. We need to be renewed to the truth of unconditional love. Unconditional love is not a theory or an intellectual idea, but something we can know by personal experience. The experiences of unconditional love will transform us. They will free us from re the religious version of the angry God. If we'll just allow God to love us. And sometimes you think that sounds so simple. And yet it's such a long journey to come from all of the religious experience I had and all of my wrong understanding about God to come to the reality the truth of being face to face being innocent and being in that place where the motives of god's heart motivate me where his passion causes me to be passionate 
where his burning desire creates in me a burning desire to only do what I see the Father doing. That is what unconditional love can do for all of us, but we do need to experience it. So I want to just, just for a short few minutes, just, just give us an opportunity to embrace unconditional love, to come to that place where we experience something deeper of the unconditional love of God. So I just encourage you just to close your eyes. And in closing your eyes, just begin to rest. Everything I've said, and I know I've given you a lot of information there, because um, I want to set a foundation for what we're going to be looking at in the future. And I want you to embrace that you're loved unconditionally. So I just want to encourage you, just begin to fix your eyes your thinking, your desire on engaging face-to-face, heart-to-heart with unconditional love. Just rest. Just be still as the unconditional love of God just surrounds you where love is poured out, lavished upon you, where every bit of guilt shame or condemnation that you have felt that people have made you feel that religion has made you feel but right now the unconditional love of God as it's flowing all over you around you and in you just washes you washes you clean so that you see yourself the way that the father sees you forgiven reconciled, justified, innocent, not guilty, pure and holy. Just let the truth, as the Father begins to speak words into your heart, words of love, words of affirmation, words of approval, He's affirming you as his child. He's approving of you as his child. He wants you to feel completely unconditionally loved. Just let that love wash over you, throw through you a rivers of living water, rivers of love, unconditional love flowing through your spirit, soul, body, You're cocooned in unconditional love. Soaking in unconditional love. Feel the unconditional love. That you're forgiven from everything from your past. completely innocent, every stain completely removed, every black spot in your DNA restored and made whole, bathed in unconditional love. Just let the frequency of love be all around you right now. Let the sound of love penetrate.
you're in a completely safe place, cocooned in love. Just be open to whatever the Father wants to show you, whatever the Father wants to say to you, wherever the Father wants to take you, as you're just resting in that safe place. Open up your heart, open up your mind, open up your whole consciousness and just experience the light of his presence, the light of love and truth. Just rest in that place of love. 